There's millions of stories about movies that overcame often extreme limitations in creative ways that, in retrospect, wound up changing how filmmaking is done forever. But one example I don't see discussed often enough is the forcefulness with which Hollywood was thrust from its massive studio sets and into large-scale location shooting. This story took place in a small town in Northern California, right in the middle of America's involvement with World War II and spearheaded by none other than Alfred Hitchcock himself. In 1942, shortly after the United States formally entered into World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt established an agency entitled the War Production Board to coordinate the wartime economy and the production of war goods. While Roosevelt resisted pushes to convert Hollywood into a simple propaganda arm of the American government, the film industry nonetheless found itself inevitably drawn into and transformed by the war effort. Under oversight from the War Production Board, film studios saw their supplies of raw film stock curtailed as the demand for the production of training films exponentially increased. New pictures in development had their film stock allotments slashed, and the number of release prints in circulation began to decline rapidly as studios lengthened run times and stockpiled finished films to preserve supplies of the valuable stock. But even more challenging for productions was the strict material rationing by the War Production Board, which limited funds spent on new materials for set building to just $5,000 in 1942, or about $94,000 in 2023. As studios scrambled to hold on to and recycle old sets, the question remained, under these new rules, could anyone make movies like they used to? That year, in the midst of all of this, Alfred Hitchcock was beginning to work on a new film called Shadow of a Doubt, finding himself in the unenviable position as one of the first major filmmakers producing under the imposing restrictions of the War Production Board. With an initial draft penned by Thornton Wilder, the playwright behind the classic Our Town, Shadow of a Doubt was the story of an idyllic American small town, darkened by the return of the charming Uncle Charlie, who, unbeknownst to his family, is being hunted by police for a series of brutal murders. While Hitchcock was fascinated with the idea, the newly enacted War Production Board restrictions on new set building made meeting the set requirements of the script, which called for a house, a bank, blocks of city streets, and more, all but impossible. Even in those days, before sets like the Mountainside Mansion in North by Northwest and Rear Window's massive recreation of a New York City apartment block, the set budgets of Hitchcock's films often exceeded $100,000, or roughly $1.9 million today. Hitchcock, famously detail-oriented, quickly found himself facing an uncomfortable reality that without the large number of sets to make the film's small town setting convincing, there was no way he would be able to make Shadow of a Doubt the way that he had intended. So, he found another way. Over the course of a month, he and his crew took over the 13,000 population town of Santa Rosa, California, with the then-revolutionary idea of filming a city-set film wholly on location, making its real-life streets into the movie set they couldn't afford to build. I don't believe you. While Santa Rosa had initially come to Hitchcock's attention because of its proximity to good food and wine in the Napa Valley, he soon found it perfectly matched to the film's setting as a typical, average American small city, and it was written by name into the script. However, for all the favors Santa Rosa did for the script, its suitability for location shooting in the early 1940s was another matter. Location shooting, or shooting in a real-world location instead of on a constructed set, is extremely common practice now, but it wasn't always. While in the era of silent films it was common to see crews shooting on location, in the years following the introduction of sound pictures, studios quickly shifted to building whatever locations the film required, big or small, on a studio lot, for one simple reason, convenience. While many westerns prior to World War II filmed on location across the American Southwest, this was largely due to the relative ease compared to their urban counterparts. Wide open plains featured few of the logistical difficulties of an urban street corner, bright sunlight kept slow film stock easily exposed, and dramatic locations saved the low-budget genre productions from having to spend on vast Hollywood sets. Films taking place anywhere near civilization were another matter altogether. For sound pictures in the early 1940s, capturing usable audio was a sensitive and complicated process even at the best of times. Though dialogue and sound effects were and are to this day frequently post-dubbed, on-set audio was much easier to record on a controlled studio set. Not only was sound recording equipment of the time heavy and unwieldy, 
The sound isolating shotgun and hypercardioid microphones films use today weren't broadly available until the early 1960s. This made even the interiors of urban locations particularly challenging for sound recordists due to the high risk of noise pollution from the streets outside. But lighting the film was going to be an even greater challenge. Movie film stocks prior to World War II and into the early 40s were significantly slower than any modern film stock, let alone a digital sensor, meaning that it took them several times more light to reach a proper exposure. Rougher documentary films at the time could and did manage to film in all sorts of challenging locations, but Hollywood pictures demanded drastically more polish. This was not a problem in a well-lit studio lot or under the bright sun of a Southern California desert, but in unpredictable urban environments, let alone interiors of the average dimly lit building, cinematographers ran the risk of coming back with borderline unusable results. Even for daytime shots, lighting urban environments for film often meant lugging around truckloads of heavy gear from location to location on residential streets. But Shadow of a Doubt also called for a number of extended night exteriors, putting Hitchcock's crew in a tough spot. At the time, city street lighting in towns like Santa Rosa was limited to relatively low output lamps prior to the broader use of the brighter mercury vapor lamps in the 1950s, making them all but useless for the weak film stocks of the 1930s that dominated film production. The crew also faced limits on the amount of lighting they could bring in for night shots due to the so-called dim-out orders across the west coast. By mid-1942, most of California was under orders by civil defense authorities to turn off all lights that could be seen from sea at night, for fear that Pacific submarines would target important buildings using the shadows created by the haze of light hovering over cities like Los Angeles. As anyone violating these dim-out orders could be criminally prosecuted, movie productions were forced to abide by strict schedules as to when their massive studio-style lights had to be turned off, all but eliminating normal hours for setting up and shooting night exterior scenes. But despite nearly everything working against them, Hitchcock and his crew embraced the challenge and set to work filming Shadow of a Doubt. Luckily, at this point in history, Hitchcock was not unfamiliar with location shooting. His previous film, Saboteur, had utilized location shooting extensively for many of its background and exterior shots, though only at a fraction of the scale to what he had planned for Shadow of a Doubt. To manage the visuals, Hitchcock brought on saboteur cinematographer Joseph Valentine, who he would later work with again on another of his innovative films, 1948's Rope. For his leads, Hitchcock had picked 1942 Oscar winner Teresa Wright and Joseph Cotton, who had acted opposite Orson Welles in Citizen Kane and starred in Welles' The Magnificent Ambersons. As the cast and crew descended upon Santa Rosa, Hitchcock almost immediately found himself face to face with the challenges of location shooting. While the citizens of the town were happily cooperative with the shoot, enamored by the prospect of a Hollywood production coming to their small town, the issues with such natural locations were clearly making themselves known. Joseph Valentine detailed one such annoyance in an article for American Cinematographer, writing, From the technical viewpoint, most of our day exteriors were of a comparatively routine nature. In some of the scenes around the house we had selected to represent the home of our picture's family, however, we had some problems in contrast. In building a set of that nature, we were accustomed to placing trees and the like largely for decorative value, but here they had been planted to provide shade. Hitchcock's crew adapted quickly and creatively. Dark home interiors were brightened up with the introduction of photo floods, a special kind of incandescent light bulb that put out significantly more illumination than ordinary incandescent bulbs, but could still run on a home electrical circuit, as well as screw into any regular outlet available. Creative lighting from larger light sources, from the floor and through the windows, worked with the natural character and design of the buildings to produce striking cinematic effects that surprised even Hitchcock. In cases where things needed to be added, such as when a house was required in the background of some of the film's night shots, and none existed, the crew creatively worked around the strict limitations of the war production board. Using cheap sheets of plywood, they built a reusable panel featuring four window panes with standard photo flood bulbs hidden behind them. This one panel, which had cost the crew only a small fraction of the allotted $5,000, could be placed anywhere they needed to create a surprisingly convincing illusion of a real house off in the distance. Several of the town's actual buildings were also used for interiors on the film, including the city's bank, a telegraph office, and a cocktail lounge, with only small tweaks needed to line them up with the look of the film. Coarse lengths of fabric, known as scrims, were placed on many of the large sunny windows to diffuse the light, 
and with a few extra lamps brought in to balance out the foreground, created, in the words of Valentine, a result in every way more natural than if we had tried to replicate those rooms with studio sets, and of course, more economical. However, the real challenge for Hitchcock and his crew was how they were going to shoot their several night exterior scenes with what limited lights they had and under the eye of California's dim-out curfew. Night exteriors are notoriously demanding to do right, even today, so Hitchcock and Valentine were forced to lean into every trick they had up their sleeves. As the demo seriously restricted unnecessary lighting after sundown, Valentine got to work crafting a backup plan. After some testing, he found a solution in adapting a standard day-for-night effect. If they shot at the right times, often in the early evening, when the sky was already beginning to dim, by lowering the camera's exposure and implementing some creative foreground lighting, they could make their exteriors look darker in the time later than it actually was. The downside of this approach, however, was practicality. To light up the nearly four blocks required for some of the night scenes, bright enough to expose the most common film stocks of the day, would have required significantly more lighting than they had brought with them for the shoot. This problem was compounded by seemingly innocuous buildings, like the city's public library, a centerpiece in one of the film's critical scenes. While it was appropriately imposing, the thick cloak of dark ivy that covered the entire building drank up every bit of light that they threw at it, threatening to show up as nothing but a dark spot on the film's negative. It was in the film's literally darkest hour that they were saved by a relatively recent technological development, the Kodak Super XX film stock. Super XX had been released a few years earlier as Kodak's premier high-sensitivity night photography film. The film almost immediately caught the attention of adventurous cinematographers, notably Greg Tolland, who went on to use the film to shoot 1941's Citizen Kane. On release, Super XX was double the sensitivity of the fastest films Kodak already had on the market, meaning, for anything shot on those films, Super XX could do it with half the light. And when push processed, this jump in sensitivity could grow several times over. In his piece for American Cinematographer, Valentine credited the film stock for much of what they were able to achieve on the film. In emergencies like this, he wrote, Super XX lets the cameraman get the maximum effectiveness out of every light. In this instance, we successfully lit up an area that only a few years ago would have demanded four or five times as much illumination to produce an inferior result. The new film stock allowed more flexible shooting of the film's night effect scenes, and even made some of the previously impossible shots possible. The wide shots of the ivy-covered library, though requiring the use of literally every lighting unit the crew had brought with them, were not just usable, but came out rich in tones and incredibly atmospheric. Other cinematographers at the time were in awe of the results achieved in such difficult circumstances, with some even insisting the night scenes must have been filmed by day with infrared film rather than actually by night. The cast and crew worked quickly and efficiently, managing to finish filming on the night scenes every time before the dim-out took effect, though Valentine noted that at least once they came in just under the wire. After a month of filming in Santa Rosa, the film finally wrapped on location, and they returned to Hollywood, forced back into the studio to pick up a few shots and scenes they had not been able to manage in town. The idea was to do the entire film up there, and we did the entire film up there. Then, unfortunately, some things had to be redone on a set. So then, after having done it economically, I'm sure, up there, they then had to spend the money to build a like set in Hollywood. In the end, the film came in well under its budget limitations, spending only $2,979 on new set building over the entire production. Cinema became an important cultural touchstone during the war, a place that united Americans, providing much-needed entertainment, shaping their sentiments, and showing them what could be accomplished through effort and ingenuity. In 1944, war correspondent Robert St. John wrote, there was a day when it was considered smart to be cynical about Hollywood. That was before the war. For Hitchcock, Shadow of a Doubt became known as his first major American picture and was received with unanimous praise upon its release. The film was recognized at the time and is still remembered to this day for its accurate capturing of the flavor and feel of an American small town, credited to their work filming on location in Santa Rosa. Hitchcock himself would later go on to lay claim to Shadow of a Doubt as his favorite of all the films that he had made. Could you instantly go to one of your films? That I prefer, you mean? Mm -hmm. well, uh, well, of course, it's always the last one, but that's too conventional an answer. No, a film I made years ago called Shadow of a Doubt. I like very much. 
Years later, in the late 1940s and early 50s, the ripple of the film's influence had spread. Directors, producers, and cinematographers now saw that shooting largely on location was not only possible, but it added a distinct character to the film. Films such as Double Indemnity and Kiss Me Deadly continued the trend Shadow of a Doubt had started that remains a large part of cinema to this day. The film would also leave a mark on every person who had worked on it. While Hitchcock's cast and crew returned to the studio to finish the film, they found themselves deeply affected by the lessons they had learned from having to work around the challenges of Santa Rosa. The difficulty in capturing the same realism of the town back on the studio lot haunted them the most. We've attempted to reproduce this effect, Valentine wrote, and other interiors we've been making since we returned to the studio. Hitch constantly eggs me on, repeatedly asking me, are you sure this isn't too perfect? Or are you sure that we could have done that in Santa Rosa? This was the first film that I went on location in, and it was not done a lot then. And it made a tremendous difference because there's no doubt that coming in and out real doorways are, and opening up real windows are better than being on a set. In his article for American Cinematographer, Valentine remarked, People talk about the realistic effects the Russians get by filming so many of their pictures against actual locations rather than sets, and with everyday people rather than professional extras moving through the scenes. They do it because they have to. Now that we're limited as to set construction, we may find in our part that while we've lost something we have considered indispensable, we'll have gained an element of realism which will more than offset it.